Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. We're one church in multiple locations. Everyone wave to our Lesby campus. Hey, Lesby. Is anyone... Okay, you three people up front. Thank you. I appreciate that. Is anyone else fired up to be here on this Sunday here at Leonardtown? All right, well, my name's Matt. I'm part of the team here. Hey, we're heading down the home stretch in our series called The Comparison Trap. Now, back in week one, we kind of admitted a hard truth, and we kind of, we're going to start off with the hard truth again this week, and it's that comparison is a trap that robs our joy and ruins our relationship. Now, we've been saying every week, listen, to use the word trap with comparison feels weird. It doesn't, it doesn't seem right, and it's because if we're really honest, comparison feels so normal, doesn't it, right? Like comparing is just something we do all the time everywhere we go. But what we've discovered over the last several weeks is that it robs our joy and it ruins our relationships. And the reason that comparison robs our joy and ruins our relationship is because comparison leads to behaviors that harm ourselves and others. As a matter of fact, week one, we said, listen, comparison leads to competing. I go from being a friend that is for you to you are an enemy that I must beat. In week one, we discovered, listen, listen, greatness isn't defined by beating people. Greatness is defined by how we love people. So when we compare, we don't have to compete. We can actually celebrate. And then in week three, we discovered, listen, listen, comparison says, listen, I want to covet. I want, I wish, I deserve, I want, and I see what you have. And, and listen, because life is unfair and I don't have the things that you have, then I can be able to do whatever it takes to get what it is that I want. And we harm ourselves and we harm others and it leads to coveting, right? And then we learned that listen, we can have contentment. Listen, that none of us, none of us can consume our way to happiness because you and I are built for purpose. And if you missed any of those messages, you can go back onto our website or YouTube channel and you can catch up. We also discovered that, listen, comparison leads to complaining. Listen, Americans could win a gold medal in complaining. Could smile. It's all right. We can just admit the truth about ourselves. Like we could win a gold medal in complaining. Well, listen, we're just never satisfied. It's never enough. It's never good enough. And then listen, comparison leads to chasing. Chasing is where we go, listen, I want the world. I want someone to give me applause. The problem is we might be seeking the applause of people that don't care. Now this week we want to talk a little bit about comparison and complaining. And listen, I have a little confession and I, I said this at the first service, so I'm just going to give you guys the same truth. Listen, as I was preparing this message about like how comparison leads to complaining, um, I discovered this message was not for you. Aren't you excited this morning? I discovered this message was for me. And so I need to confess that as I went through and as I prepared this message, the things that I'm going to share are things that I feel like God spoke to my heart, things that I can work on, things that I'm still growing on. I need this, much, this message as much as anyone. So I just want to be really fair and go, hey, this is much for me as it is for you. Now, when it comes to comparison leading to complaining, can we just admit a fact? Listen, between advertising and between marketing and between social media, you and I buy in to a lie that we're all too willing and gladly to accept. And, and here's the lie that we buy in because of marketing and social media. It's this, it's this, listen, that you and I don't have all the life we deserve, do we? I mean, we, we have some of the life we deserve, but we don't have all the life we deserve. And because you and I don't have all the life we deserve because we see it in the marketing, we should look like that, we should have that. And, and because of social media, we see what other people have. And because I don't have all that I should have, we complain, I complain, you complain. Matter of fact, I think in America, we're some of the best complainers in the world. I've discovered we as Americans, we can complain about everything. We complain about the weather. It's beautiful outside. Well, the pollen's bad out there. <laughs> pollen's bad out there. It's raining. Oh, it's too much rain. It doesn't rain. There's no rain. It's, you know, it snows. It's too cold. Like we're never, ever happy. We complain about the weather. We complain about the traffic. Oh, the base traffic. Listen, I drove on 495. Stop crying, right? Listen, we complain about everything. We complain about the traffic. We complain about the weather, right? We complain that when we go to a restaurant, we don't want to get exactly what we want or it isn't cooked the right way. We can afford to eat out. Someone makes our food and we can do that. But we complain about that. We complain about our jobs that provide for us. We complain about our coworkers. We complain about our boss, right? And we complain about our homes. We complain about our cars. We complain about our kids. Why can't they do the chores? And I think that's why God gives you teenagers so that you'll be happy when they go. See you, kiddies, right? Chirp, 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 right? Like we complain about stuff. We complain about everything. We complain about our family. We complain about our spouses don't elbow them right now, right? We are world-class complainers. We can complain about everything. But here's the thing, just like every week we've talked about, when we complain, do we ever really ask one of the most important questions? And it's this, does complaining really help and does complaining lead to the results that we want? And as in each week we've said, listen, listen, here's the scary part. We already have the answer. 
Matter of fact, we've experienced the answer. Matter of fact, this question of does complaining help or hurt and does it lead to the results? Well, listen, social science has done research and studies on this and, and the evidence is in, the kind of the, the survey results are in and the results are kind of what you and I would expect. Matter of fact, as I did some research on this, I found some interesting articles and I wanna share them with you this morning. Um, I found this in um, Incorporated Magazine. It says, listen, when most of us indulge in a bit of the moan, what they're saying is, listen, most of us, you know, when something doesn't, we don't get what we want, something doesn't go the want, we complain and we complain because the idea is to vent. Listen, I can, you know, just get it out, our emotions out of it. You know, we say, I'm letting it go. And if we're really honest, we're not really letting it go. We're just letting you know what we're holding on to, right? Amen. So Amen. And if you missed that, right? By getting our emotions out, we reason, we say to mind, listen, if I just get it out, which isn't really letting it go, I'm holding on to it, but I just want you to know that I'm holding on to it, right? We reason that we'll feel better. But read the next sentence. But science suggests there are a few serious flaws in that reasoning. So the research and the science has said, listen, that something unique happens in our brains when I complain, when you complain, when we complain, something happens in our brain that when we complain, it's easier to complain the next time. And then the next time you complain, it begins to build these neurons and these pathways in your brain that you'll want to complain some more. Matter of fact, the article continues to say this. It says, so let's boil that down. Having a thought makes it easier for you to have that thought again. So once you complain, you're like, oh, that was pretty fun. That felt pretty good. I should complain again. And when you complain again, it's easier to have that same thought and be negative. And that's not good for the perpetual gloomy Eeyore, right? And then it continues to go on and say this, though happily, it seems gratitude can work the opposite way, building up your positivity muscles. We're gonna come back to that later in the message, but I want you to remember that both complaining and kind of negativity and gratitude actually have the same thing. If, you, if you're grateful, you'll then to be more grateful and you'll begin to have a pattern of gratefulness. And if you're negative and complaining, you'll lead to a bad. It gets worse too. Not only do repeated negative thoughts make it easier to think more negative thoughts, Quitting the complaining habit is essential. Listen, this isn't a Christian group. This, is, this isn't a Christian magazine. This, is, this isn't some Bible study. This is, this is in, Magazine Incorporated, right? And they're saying quitting complaining habit is essential for your physical health. Two, when your brain is firing off these synapses of anger, listen, I didn't get the parking spot. They didn't bring me what I want. Why don't I have a house? Why don't I have that car, right? Why am I not getting what I want? You're weakening your immune system. You're raising your blood pressure. You're increasing your risk of heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and a plethora of other negative ailments. So not only when do you complain, do you create the opportunity for that to be a habit, you also begin to affect your body negatively. Matter of fact, Huffington Post puts it this way. I like what they said. And we're gonna put it up here on the screen. They said this, they said, listen, repeated complaining rewires your brain to make future complaining more likely. So when we complain, you know what's gonna happen? We're gonna complain some more. And then we complain some more, you know what's gonna happen? We're gonna complain. It rewires our brain. Over time, you find it's easier to be negative than to be positive, regardless of what's happening around you. You're like Eeyore, I'm like Eeyore, we're like Eeyore. Everywhere we go, we bring the rain cloud with us, right? That's what happens when we get in the habit of complaining. And it continues to say this, complaining becomes your default behavior, which changes how people perceive you. And it goes on to say, while it's not an exaggeration to say that complaining leads to brain damage, it rewires your brain, it doesn't stop there. When you complain, your body releases stress hormone, cortisol. And this cortisol does bad things to your body. Cortisol shifts you into fight or flight mode. It, it juices you all, you get all jacked up, directing your oxygen and blood, your energy away from everything but systems that are essential for immediate survival. So complaining, one, doesn't help anything. Two, complaining means that you're gonna complain some more. When you and I complain, it does something to our physical bodies that creates physical harm. And you've already experienced this truth that we're about to discover. The research points to this and it's our opening truth this morning. We're gonna put it up here on the screen and if you're following along, listen. Complaining often feels helpful. I'm just gonna get it off my chest. I'm just gonna let them know how I actually feel. We feel like complaining is gonna help us, but it actually harms us emotionally, physically, and spiritually. I mean, think about it. When you and I complain, it gets us stuck in a cycle of negativity. It doesn't help us feel better. It really doesn't vent. The science proves that when we vent, it just makes us feel worse. We're not really letting it go. It harms us physically. It does things to our body and to our brain that keep us unhealthy. And lastly, spiritually, it disconnects us from our creator. And it leaves you and I asking a necessary question. 
And here's why the question is necessary. Because think about it, listen, you and I live in a culture, you and I live in a world with the marketing and the advertising and the social media that drives us to compare. Look, you should have this clone. Look, you should have this iPhone. You should drive this kind of car. You should wear this kind of clothes and you should look like this. And if you don't, you're missing out. You're not having all the life that you have. So we're driven to compare, which leads us into complaining, which leads us to a question that we must answer. How do you and I not fall for the trap of complaining? Because complaining seems like it helps, but it really harms us emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Now, this is where I, the part of every Sunday, I love to get to because I say this, this is why I wake up before my alarm. This is why I'm so glad to be a follower of Jesus. Because listen, way before social science ever confirmed, listen, listen, social science just confirmed what we knew. Listen, you've experienced it. I've experienced it. We already knew that complaining doesn't really help. It just makes us feel worse. We already knew that. But before social science confirmed it, kind of through brain scans and all the other research they've done, God, God told us this. Listen, this is why I love being a follower of Jesus. God God knew that in every culture that all people, listen, doesn't matter whether you have no faith or different faith, or maybe you grew up in the faith. Listen, every single one of us will struggle with complaining and its negative effects. So answering how not to fall into this trap is something that each of us will have to figure out. And I love how simple, and God has been telling this from the very beginning, how simple God puts this. Matter of fact, I found this one scripture and it's so good, it's so simple. Listen, here's what I've discovered about following Jesus. It's not complicated, it's just not always easy. So this morning I wanna put this scripture up on the screen. It comes from Proverbs 17, 22, and it says, listen, being cheerful keeps you, let's, let's try that one more time. Being cheerful keeps you, Listen, there's, listen, social science has proven this true. But before social science came along, God was telling you, listen, if you have gratitude in your heart, if you are thankful, it actually has a physical impact on your body. It keeps you healthy. It is a slow to be gloomy all the time. Eeyore is going to die young. And if you're an Eeyore, it ain't looking good for you. Right, listen, I love what God, listen, before social science confirmed what we already know, being cheerful keeps you healthy. It's a slow death to be gloomy all the time. Now, I have people all the time ask me, Matt, in a busted and broken world where sometimes life is hard and it doesn't go the way I want, how can I have gratitude? How, how can I be cheerful? Well, I love it because God tells us why and how we can be. We see this in Psalms. We're going to put it up here on the screen. It says, let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. No, 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 let's stop here. Listen, can we just, I, th I think we just need a moment of perspective about the things that God has done for us. I mean, think about taste buds. Have you ever thought about taste buds and bacon? Taste buds allow you to taste bacon. I had bacon this morning and it was good. Right, but God didn't have to create taste buds. God could have just had us, you know, put vegetables on our brain, you know, like, but he gave us taste buds so we can enjoy chocolate. God gave us eyes to see the beauty of a sunset. God gave us ears to hear the laughter of a child. God gave us nerve endings so that we can feel the warmth of an embrace. God has given us good things, a body to work around and look at the world. You and I, if we were really honest, most of us had a meal, slept in a place and have most of our health. We have a reason to go, God has given us good things. But it doesn't just stop there. It says this, it says, he forgives all my sins. Here's what's amazing. Listen, it doesn't matter why you're here today. Listen, South Point is a place where you can come as you are. But the great news is none of us have to stay that way. It doesn't matter where you've been. God is more concerned about where you're going. And the greatest news is, listen, it doesn't matter what we've done. Our sins can be forgiven, not through religion, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. He heals all of our diseases. Listen, we might not have our healing on this side of eternity because even if you get healed from whatever is ailing you now, you will face death. But Jesus overcame death. He redeems us from death and he crowns me with love and tender mercy. Any God that would die for you is for you. You know why we can have a thankful and an attitude of gratitude? Is we have a God who is for us. So this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to kind of give three observations straight from Scripture as it, it deals with kind of comparison and leading to complaining and some kind of steps we can take. And so I want to walk us through this. But listen, I want to be really honest. The first one, I didn't like it. The first one, matter of fact, it just it smacked me between the eyes. I didn't like it. I didn't like writing it. I don't even like talking about it. So I just need you to emotionally prepare. Bing, buckle up. You're not going to like it. But, but here's observation number one straight from Scripture. And we're going to put it up here on the screen. It says, complaints are the bricks that become the foundation for bitterness. 
You see, when you and I complain, and we have a complaint, it's like a little brick, and we just start to build. Here's a complaint, and there's a complaint, and here's another little complaint. And as we add enough complaints, eventually bitterness begins to grow in our heart and in our soul. Uh, true story, um, I've lived in my house for, for almost 20 years. But a matter of fact, when I first moved to my house, my neighbor was a retired guy. He since has sold the house. But I thought he was crazy because when I moved there, his whole yard was dug up. It was brown. There wasn't a single blade of grass in my neighbor's yard. Just think about how weird that is. Like I came from Loudoun County, moved here to Southern Maryland. It was already a little bit different, but my neighbor had no grass. I was like, man, I've moved to crazy town. But what I didn't know, a couple days later, he had planted some seed and he put the straw in there and he was out there watering it. He was retired. And soon he had this beautiful grass. And then when I looked at my yard, I realized why he did what he did. Is my yard was just filled with weeds, but I had kids, so I don't care. I wish it all died. I'd paint it with green, green paint, you know? Just don't care. And soon after a little while, this, you know, after one season, the grass was pretty. And the second season, it began to grow in. And listen, my neighbor was fanatical. My neighbor would go out there every three days and he would mow his grass. And he wouldn't mow it too low so it would burn. He wouldn't mow it too high. And he'd get out there with his hands and he'd pick out the weed. He had the prettiest lawn I've ever seen. And so one time I was out on a walk and I was walking. I had a, my oldest daughter at that time was about two or three. And our yard had all these weeds and dandelions. And so my daughter grabbed a handful of dandelions and she had one hand full here and another one she would take him and she would blow him <sighs> and the problem was the wind was blowing all into my my neighbor's yard and I, I had this look and she's just having fun <laughs> <sighs> and all those little things are flying in his yard and I literally I'll never forget I am running down the road going like this <laughs> because if my neighbor sees that my daughter is blowing dandelion seeds into his perfect yard he is going to freak out now we all laugh and we all get the point. But the reality is, is that when you and I complain, it's like taking a dandelion seed of bitterness and blowing it into our heart and our soul. Matter of fact, there was this guy, his name was the Apostle Paul. Matter of fact, he didn't start off as the Apostle. Matter of fact, he was a guy who didn't believe in Jesus. Matter of fact, he persecuted the church. And he didn't become a Christ follower because of the teachings. He didn't become a Christ follower because of an organization. Paul became a Christ follower because he encountered a risen Jesus. And when he encountered a risen Jesus, he started to follow him and he started to plant churches. He started to tell people about Jesus. And there was this church in Philippi that he had planted. And it was made up of a group of people a lot like you. There were some people who had no church background, some people who had different faith backgrounds, and some who had grown up kind of in the Jewish faith. And, and the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Philippi these words that we're going to take a look at. Here's what he writes. He says, listen, in every, what's that word right there? Every. Come on, can we do it together? In? Every. Now just, just for a second. Do you know what everything means? It's not a trick question. I'm not that smart. Everything means everything. And everything you do, stay away from? Now, could you imagine, like, I'm Facebook friends with some of y'all. <laughs> Just stop it. <laughs> like he just says, stay away from complaining and arguing so that no one can speak a word of blame against you. He goes on to can say this, you are to live clean, innocent lives as the children of God in a dark world full of people who are crooked and stubborn. Shine out among them like beacons of light. The Apostle Paul says this, he says, listen, here's what I've discovered. In a busted and broken world where everyone feels like their life isn't all that they deserve to be, everyone complains, everyone argues. If you choose to be someone who's not a complainer and someone who doesn't argue, you will be a beacon of light to people around you. A little bit later, this guy, Apostle Paul, who came to know Christ, writes another church, and he says, this is why we shouldn't complain, and this is why we shouldn't argue. And here's what he says. He says, listen, look after each other so that none of you will fail to find God's best blessing. That's why we do small groups. We should do life together. That's why our third value is life is better together. But he doesn't just stop there. He says, listen, watch out that no bitterness takes root among you. For as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. So the Apostle Paul knew something that God had revealed to them. Listen, that when bitterness plants itself in our hearts, when bitterness plants itself in our soul, it's a root and it's a weed that comes up and it chokes the life out of us. Bitterness will choke the life out of us. Now you might be asking, listen, does complaining really lead to bitterness? Yes. 
You know what happens when we complain? Because if we're really honest, we don't just go, ah, oh, shucks, I missed the light. Ah, oh, shucks, I didn't get the service. Ah, oh, shucks, I didn't get what I wanted. We're usually pretty visceral. And here's why. Because here's what complaining does. Complaining, we turn our inconvenience and our discomfort. Listen, when I wrote this, I cringed because this is so true of me. I turned my inconvenience and my discomfort into injustice. Well, why do they get to be in the front of the line? Why do they get to have that car? Why did they get that thing that I wished? Why didn't this happen to me? And my life isn't all that it should be, and that is unfair and it's unjust. So here's what I do. I turn simple inconveniences and simple discomforts into injustice, and the world has wronged me, and now it owes me, and I am bitter. But it gets worse before it gets better because complaining isn't just about turning inconvenience and, and discomfort into injustice. It's where we turn ourselves into victims who are not responsible for our situation. Well, I didn't get that raise or promotion, well, because they were the, you know, the boss's pet. I, I didn't get this because of that and, and this because of that. And so it's never, ever my fault. I'm never, ever responsible. I'm not responsible for my actions or the things that happened to me. Complaining turns ourselves into victims who are not responsible. And at the end, when we build the bricks through complaining for bitterness, here's what happens. Bitterness warps our view of ourselves, others, and God, right? I mean, can we just be honest? When we complain enough, bitterness sets in, it begins to choke the life, and we see ourselves as victims. We have no responsibility for how we live or to make changes in our lives. We're just victims, and we're not responsible for anything, so we're just going to sit back. And we view others. They owe us. I don't know why they got what they wanted, but I deserve it. And so now they owe me and God has been negligent. And it bends how we see ourselves, others, and God. So we're left asking, well, if we don't complain, what do we do? See, this is why you guys are so smart. That's a great question. Which leads me straight into observation number two, which is this. Gratitude is a compass to our soul that points to true north. You see, gratitude directs us. Gratitude is a compass to our soul, to our heart, that points us to the true direction of life. Um, true story, it happened about, about five, six weeks ago, maybe about a month, month and a half ago. I was driving here in the county. It was in the middle of the summer. It was one of those days that had been hot and humid all day. It was dark. I was running back from doing an errand, and we got one of those thunderstorms that you get typically in the afternoon, but it happened at night, um, and it had been steaming hot all day, high 90s. It started to rain. The cool weather came in, and as the the rain hit the pavement. It was, it was so temperature different that it, that steam and that kind of fog that rises up came up off the pavement. It, it was raining pretty hard. And you know, I'm a moron. I've told you all this plenty of times from up front. I never lie. I'm a moron. I should have. It was raining so hard. I should have pulled off the side of the road, but I'm one of those people, the rain ain't going to win, right? And so uh, when I'm in the hospital and dead, I'll go, oh, the rain did win. Anyway, so I should have put off, and I was, I, the windshield wipers were on the fastest thing, and this rain, it was fall, I could not see. And I literally thought, I'm on a one-way road. I'm either going to hit a tree or I'm going to hit someone. But the cool thing is, listen, listen, my car has these things called fog lights. It's cool. There's a little button, and you take the little button on my lights, and you flip it to the fog light one, and then these, there's these lights at the bottom of my car, right on the sides, and, and they're, they're yellow lights, and they kind of don't reflect so bad on, on anything that you can't see, and what they do is, is they shine light on the lines of the road, and so I turned the fog lights on, and even though I couldn't see in front of me, the fog lights showed me where the yellow line was and where the white line was. And even though I couldn't see very far, I kept my eye on the line so I didn't wreck. You want to know what gratitude is? Gratitude are the fog lights of our heart and our soul. Because if we are really honest, sometimes there's the fog of success. That sometimes we're doing so well and life is going so good, we just have big britches. And we forget that we didn't get there by ourselves, that God was a part of that process. But there's not just the fog of success, there's the, there's the haze of pain and suffering and brokenness when life doesn't work. And whether it's success or whether it's pain, sometimes feelings blind us. And we go through life and when we're blind, we'll sometimes wreck. I love what the scripture points us to about gratitude. We're gonna put it up here on the screen. And it says, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. See, I love, the Bible doesn't call us to religion. It doesn't call us to a pastor. It doesn't call us to an organization. It doesn't call us to a political party. It calls us to follow Jesus. 
Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth. And we're gonna come to the second that you are taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. That there's something about a vibrant living relationship with Jesus that we're connected with him that our hearts will be thankful. But see, there's a truth in here that we need to have for our hearts to be thankful. And here's the truth that we need to grow and here's the truth that we need to understand. And I'm gonna put it up on the screen. Listen, in this world, you and I are gonna face this. And we're gonna put it up here. You and I in this world, and see, this is what I love about Jesus. Jesus was the truth teller. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus says, listen, in this world, there's brokenness. In this world, there's heartache. In this world, there's pain. In this world, there's grief. In this world, there's injustice. In this world, there is sorrow. Now, if there was no Jesus, we should complain all day long. And for many of us, we see only this. But there's a truth in Jesus because the tomb is empty. See, th see, this is what separates Jesus from everything else. Jesus says, I'm God's son, and I'm gonna prove it to you. They're gonna nail me to a cross. I'm gonna be dead. I'm gonna be buried. You come check, and I'll be risen from the dead. And his tomb is empty. You can disagree on what his empty tomb means, but here's what his empty tomb means. Listen, life isn't just this anymore. The empty tomb of Jesus and his being raised from the dead, we're gonna put it to the next one, which is this. Listen, despite of what happens here and now, because Jesus conquered hell and death, redemption is possible, healing is possible, joy is possible, justice will happen, eternal life and inheritance. Listen, it's like we're in the middle of a story and the middle of the story is always tough. The middle of the story, there's pain. In the middle of the story, there's always great tension. But listen, when you get to the end of the story, it always turns out well, usually. And the end of the story for those who follow Jesus is that Jesus overcame hell and death. Listen, no matter what happens to you in life, we have things to be grateful for. You and I will not be defined by this block over here. That's great news. Because listen, none of, listen, here's what we want. And there's a lot of preachers who make money and have a following because here's what we want. We want to go, listen, I want to come to church. I want to believe in God. I want to do whatever religious activity I need to do so that I can get a pass from this. None of us wants to experience that. But Jesus said, listen, that's not, that's not true. Jesus says, if you follow me, you're gonna experience some of this brokenness in life. But here's why you can take joy. Here's the truth part. The story's not finished. There's a day where he's going to come back and he's going to make it all right. And those who follow him will receive their inheritance. And there'll be joy. Death will lost its sting. All wrongs will be made right. Those who are broken and busted will be, making, be made well. We can have gratitude. Gratitude is the compass. It's the fog lights that as we go through either the fog of success or the haze of pain, it keeps us on the path that God has for us. Because here's what I've discovered. Listen, listen. I've discovered this firsthand. And I'm telling you a truth. This is a true statement. Listen, listen. Feelings are real, but they're not always true. You and I will have real feelings, real feelings of pain, real feelings of grief, real, real feelings of success, real feelings of like, I'm invincible. We'll have legitimate and real feelings, but they're not always true. Gratitude points us to the truth that there's a God who is for us. There's a God who walks alongside with us. It points to true north. Which leads me kind of straight into observation number three. And this is observation number three. Actually, I'm gonna finish this. Let's, uh, let's, um, let's go back up because I missed something here. Uh, listen, gratitude just isn't a biblical idea. Social science, I found this article in talentsmart.com. They're talking about social IQ and how to perform in the world. And they're talking about complaining and negativity. And they talked about this. This is, again, not Christian. Listen, there are two things you can do when you feel the need to complain. One is to cultivate an attitude of that is, when you feel like complaining, shift your attention to something that you are grateful for. We all have something to be grateful for. There's a God who made us, a God who loves us, and a God who wants to be our friend. It goes on to say this. It goes on to say, taking time to contemplate what you're grateful for isn't merely the right thing to do. It's not just morally good. Listen, it reduces the stress hormone cortisol by 23%. Research conducted at the University of California found that, that people who worked daily, again, you see that word, worked? Listen, 
Cultivating gratitude doesn't come naturally. It is a practice we must do. That people who work daily to cultivate an attitude of gratitude experience improved mood, energy, and substantial less anxiety due to the lower, lower cortisol levels. It's what Proverbs said. A cheerful heart makes you healthy. Which leads us straight into observation number three. Gratitude is not about being weird and dishonest about how you feel. True story. Um, when I was younger, just out of high school, I became a, a Christ follower and I went to this one church. And this one church had a lot of good things, but there was this one thing that always caught me kind of off guard. And it was that like when bad things happen to people, a lot of people would say, praise the Lord. And I, I, I was like, that's weird, dude. Like people would lose their job, you know, think bad things happen. People go, praise the Lord. And then smile. And I go like, dude, like I'd be like, why are you like, that's bad. Like, and, and here's what happened. Here's what I discovered is somewhere along the line, someone twisted the scripture that says, be thankful in all things to where there were people who were being weird and going, I'm going to be thankful for all things. And can you see that there's a difference? Like you can be thankful in all things, but you don't have to be thankful for all things. Listen, it is true that, listen, if you lose your job, that's hard. If you have a kid who's not struggling and not going the way they want to, it's okay to have pain and grief. If you struggle with chronic pain, it's okay to grieve that. If you lose a loved one, grief is normal. Listen, gratitude is not about being weird and dishonest about how you feel. See, there's a difference between complaining and lamenting. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. Listen, complaining is basically not getting what we want. Complaining is when we go, oh, I didn't, I didn't get the green light that I wanted. I didn't get the clothes I wanted. I don't have the TV I wanted. I didn't get the iPhone. I didn't get the promotion. I don't have the how. I didn't get what I want. We complain when it just doesn't go the way we want it to. Now, lamenting is different. Lamenting is grieving. It's about grief, sorry, sorrow, and pain. Matter of fact, Jesus lamented. He wasn't complaining, but he was being honest. Matter of fact, we see Jesus doing this. We put it up on the screen in Matthew 23. Jesus is speaking. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. Jesus is saying, listen, this city that I created, this group of people, the Israelites that, that are my children, you're, you're not doing so well. And he goes on to say this. He says, laments, how often I've wanted to gather your children together. He says, listen, I wanted to gather you in as sons and daughters of the Most High, as a hen protects her chicks beneath the wings, but you wouldn't let me. Jesus wasn't complaining about them. Jesus was lamenting. He was heartbroken that his sons and daughters would not come home. And the reality is, is that a healthy relationship always has the ability to share both good and bad. You know what? God is big enough that when we succeed, we can go, yay, thank you, God. But our relationship with God and God is also big enough and strong enough and we should have a healthy enough relationship that we lose our job to go, God, this stinks. When our kids struggle to say, God, this hurts. When we lose something we love or someone we love, it's okay to say, God, it hurts and I'm grieving. But there's a difference. We don't have to be weird or dishonest. We don't have to be thankful for all things, but we can be thankful in all things. Which leads me, if I was going to sum up this whole message, it would go like this. In the grind of life, in the grind of life, gratitude is a GPS signal <coughs> that safely points us in the right direction. Listen, Jesus tells us in John 16, he says, listen, in this world, you will have trouble, but I've overcome the world to take heart. Listen, in the light and grind of life, listen, you and I are going like, to have good times. We're going to have good things, but we're also going to experience some things that are tough. We're also going to experience some things that are hard. In the grind of life, you and I are going to have ups and downs, but gratitude is the anchor that doesn't get us too high when we're succeeding, and it, does, it helps us pick us up when we're experiencing pain, and it points us to a reality that there's a God who's for us and who has a plan for our life and doesn't want bitterness and complaining to choke the life out of us because here's the truth when you and I are blinded by the fog of success when you and I are blinded by the haze of pain and grief we usually end up outside the lines that God has for us and when we cross the double lines in life it usually leads to a wreck that has destruction and pain the very thing that Jesus died for so that we could avoid, so that God could redeem us from. So listen, we're all gonna deal with comparison. It's just around us. And all of us are gonna be tempted 
to complain. But if we practice the habit of gratitude, as I was thinking about this week, I tried it and I didn't do as good as I wanted to, but I did something. And this is the challenge I want to give each and every one of you today. Is that at the beginning of the day in my journal, I was trying to write down one thing in about three or out of the four days when I started thinking about this, I, I got it done. But every morning, write one thing that you're thankful for. And then before you go to bed, just before you go to bed, find a piece of paper or, or say out loud one thing that you're grateful for. Because when we practice gratitude, it makes sure that the weeds of bitterness don't get stuck in our soul. It's a light and a signal that guides us to a truth, to the kind of life that God wants us to have so that bitterness doesn't wreck or choke our life. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I just wanna thank you for today, God. I have, like, this is an area, like, I, I am a world-class complainer. And so, Heavenly Father, I'm just, I'm sorry, God. Um, God, I pray that for any of us that, have, that have, can have the habit of complaining, God, that you would help us to cultivate a truth, to know that because of you, we can have a heart of gratitude, that we can be grateful, that you have a plan for us, and that gratitude lights up the way so that we don't get struck or blinded by our feelings that can sometimes blind us. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for giving us Jesus. Thank you that in the midst of this busted and broken world, we can be grateful and have a truth that no matter what happens on this side of eternity, the empty tomb reminds us that we win. That God, that you overcame all of that brokenness and all, all that heartache so that we could experience life because you love us. That we can have hearts of thankfulness Thank you, God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.